Cameron, thank you. All right, my name is Jarrett Brown. I'm going to be representing Pennsylvania today. Uh, first off, I want to start off by thanking the American Forage and Grassland Council for inviting me here today. Uh, I am truly honored to be here and talk with you about some of the things that I have implemented on this operation uh, since I've started and uh, what was going on now. Um, I got my education at Penn State University where I graduated in 2012. I got my bachelor's degree in agricultural science. Tussock Sedge Farm is a 100% grass-fed beef operation. Um, the grass-fed beef operation was started in 2009. Before it was a grass-fed beef operation, it was just a, a cash crop farm and hay, and they had a few beef cattle. Um, they had a couple rough years. Uh, in 2009, they wanted to enter into a, a, a niche market, and um, that's where we still are today. Uh, Tussock Sedge Farm is made up of 550 preserve acres in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Uh, you can see right here we're down in the southeast uh, corner of the state, about 45 minutes north of Philadelphia. On the farm, we do have 125 acres of forest stewardship. Uh, it was logged out and then put into a 110-year uh, forest, uh, forest stewardship program. Uh, we have 35 acres of preserved wetlands and wildlife habitat where we have planted over 500-plus trees, native trees, and also... Um, 100 bluebird boxes, and you can see down here, uh, here's a barn owl box that we have out in the middle of our field. We have different bird watchers that come to our property um, that live in the county, and they put, blue, or they put uh, barn owl boxes in all of our bank barns that we have, and then a few in our field. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, different things like that. Um, we also uh, farm an additional 250 acres rented ground. Uh, some of that ground is uh, for forage on our farm for our cattle. Um, some of it is also for mulch hay. We're not far from a mulch plant, a mushroom plant, um, and we do make some mulch hay. Uh, in 2014, this picture right here down at the bottom left, uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania gifted us the award of the Clean Water Farm Award um, due to all of the different practices that we do on our farm, fencing off stream banks, buffer zones, and, and things of that uh, nature. Conservation and soil management, uh, some of the different uh, conservation and soil management things that we do, we make our own compost. We get leaves from three of the local townships that are near us. We take those leaves, we mix, we mix that with our bed pack manure and some of the mulch hay that we have, and then we apply that to our fields. We are trying to boost our organic matter, boost our fertility as much as we can. I find that very important. Um, we work closely with NRCS um, to ensure that we have a high standard of conservation and good farming practices. Um, they've helped out with fencing off stream banks, uh, interior fencing, um, you know, fencing out waterways and different things of that nature, um, some of the things that they have helped us with. Uh, this is a picture right here down at the bottom right. This is an area where... Uh, we repaired some of the washouts that we have. Some of the ground that we have is really sloped ground, and we did put in four, mi uh, four miles of terraces to help with erosion and things of that nature, but you can still see we still do deal with some problems. So we'll fill those ditches in, we'll reseed them, and then we'll fence those out from the cattle so that grass can establish properly and so we don't have erosion problems of that nature. On our farm, uh, we don't guess. We soil test. Uh, there's farmers out there that, you know, I have friends, they don't soil test. They've been doing the same thing every year and that works for them and that's just fine. On our farm, uh, we do soil tests. We soil test every three years and then we apply uh, any fertilizers or minerals that are needed, uh, lime, anything of that sort. Uh, the, the nitrogen that we do use, uh, we do coat that nitrogen if we're afraid that you know we might not have the rain or anything like that. We will coat that nitrogen so we don't uh, lose it. Uh, another thing with the slow release, um, that was something that NRCS kind of brought to our attention, a slow release nitrogen. Um, so it's all not put onto the field at once. It will, we will get some utilization of that nitrogen um, a couple weeks later. Um, and that's something that I really like. I've noticed a difference. I've split fields in half, and I've noticed a huge difference with using that slow release compared to not using it. And, we also do split applications. We don't apply all of our nutrients at once, our nitrogen at once, especially on our perennial pastures. Um, so we do use split ap applications. Uh, I like to get anywhere from 100 pounds to 150 pounds, especially on our perennial pastures. Um, 
and that's uh, kind of what we apply there. Uh, like I said, we soil test every three years. I will do a soil test though. If we are gonna put a perennial pasture in, I will take a soil test, being that that field is gonna be established anywhere six, eight, 10 years. Uh, we wanna make sure that you know we're, we're starting it off right and um, it's getting everything that needs to establish. All right, Tussock Sedge Farm, uh, we have Red Angus cattle and we do cow calf to finish. Like I said, we are grass fed. Uh, when I started at Tussock Sedge Farm as farm manager after I graduated in 2012, uh, we were doing about 70 cows. Uh, uh, we were finishing around 60 to 65 head a year and the owner, they were finishing on dry hay and it was taking anywhere from 28 to 30 months. And to me, that is just unacceptable. I think in the cattle business, you can do a lot better than that, uh, no questions asked. By 2017, we were up to 120 cows. We were finishing anywhere from 105 to 110 head. Um, we were finishing on annual forages, um, haylage, and uh, it was taking us you know, 22 to 24 months. We were even as low as 19 and a half months. So big improvement there. And I'm gonna talk a little bit, uh, a little bit later on some of the forages that we used and why we used them. Uh, we do have two calving seasons, a uh, fall and a spring for finished beef year round to supply our retail store. Um, two things, it splits up our uh, workload as far as calving uh, goes, so that's another thing. And then for our retail store, so we have beef year round. Uh, if we calved all at the same time, that beef will be finishing at the same time. So this gives us a uh, supply year round. Involvement in the community. Where we're located in Pennsylvania, like I said, we're about 40, 45 minutes uh, north of Philadelphia. High population, I believe it's around uh, 620,000 people. Um, so we like to involve the community as much as we can in our farm, being that we do have a retail store, it benefits us in that way also. So we always hosted uh, annually Bucks County 4-H Beef and Vet Science Club. These youth come out to our farm and they help with castrating, sorting these calves from the cows, weaning, uh, deworming these calves, and uh, weaning these calves. I find this great, especially when I was in 4-H, you know, I never really had the opportunity uh, to go out to different farms and big farms as such, such as ours in our county to really work on the farm and get the experience that these kids really are looking for. So we bring these out, they work with animal handling, uh, they get the experience of running these cattle through the chute, and uh, they really enjoy it. And every year the group keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's really something that we like uh, to do and uh, we enjoy it. Uh, we also worked in correlation with Delaware Family University, um, starting and supporting their sustainable ag program. They were starting up a sustainable ag major and uh, they got a hold of us and they wanted us to kind of be a part of that um, for, for talking purposes and also for, uh, we actually donated uh, 25 cow calf, or sorry, we didn't donate, they were still ours, but we brought them to one of their satellite farms and they were able to have their students um, come to this uh, satellite farm and be able to work there or be able to bring classes there. And uh, it was basically a different aspect of agriculture that they weren't learning. Um, and uh, you know, sustainable ag, grass-fed, rotational grazing, these types of things um, they were able to uh, do. We also host uh, forage and agronomy classes from Del Valle University. They'll come out to our farm. We'll do a little field walk, and I'll talk about the different forages that we use and why we use them and how they benefit us. Um, another thing that we do annually, we'll do it once a year, and we'll, we'll kind of push this through our store we tell our customers or we'll tell our neighbors and, or we'll, you know, we'll put it on Facebook or anything like that. Come to our farm, learn about our farm. The biggest thing about us is we want to be as tra transparent as possible. Uh, especially in today's uh, world, you know, we all know um, the stuff that's going on, you know, hearsay, this and that. We want our consumers to know exactly what we are doing, how we are doing it, so there's nothing hidden. Um, so we invite them out, we, everybody hops up on a wagon, we go around the farm and uh, I'll talk a little bit about you know, what we do and uh, why we do it. And uh, they really appreciate that. Fencing and water systems. Our exterior fence is a five strand high tensile electric wire. 
We have an interior fence of two strand uh, high tensile electric wire, and those are divided up into 10 acre paddocks. Uh, NRCS helped out a lot with that. Uh, we, uh, the farm started out continuous grazing, uh, had some problems with uh, different wet areas and waterways and creeks that they were mudding up, and NRCS didn't like that too much. So they actually came out and they helped us out a lot with putting interior fence in and really dividing those pastures up into 10 acre paddocks. We then used temporary poly fence, uh, the geared reels with the step-in stakes, the pigtail uh, step-in stakes, and um, we break those pastures up. Then if it's a perennial pasture, we'll break it up anywhere from maybe an acre to, to four acres, depending on the time of the season and the growing, and uh, if it's a spring flush, if it's growing a lot, or if it's the summer, we'll give them a bigger area. Um, and we even break pastures up into six foot sections, and I'll talk about that uh, here in a minute. Our watering system in our pastures is quite simple. It's just an above ground, uh, 180 PSI, poly, one inch poly pipe. Uh, every 500 feet, uh, we have a valve in place, a water valve in place where we have the above ground water tanks. Um, some people say this is a little close. I like having the water close to the cattle. They don't have to walk as much. Uh, the, the finishers aren't burning as much calories as they are walking from water trying to, trying to get something to drink. Um, so they're able, to, they're able to put pounds on a little easier. Um, so we also pull our minerals, uh, minerals around with a, just a weather vane mineral type. We'll hook a chain up to that. They get free choice salt and minerals and, um, and then they're good to go. All right, uh, perennial forages. Um, some of the perennial forages uh, that we use are the two top ones are orchard grass and perennial ryegrass. Those are the two that I love the best. Um, perennial ryegrass, in my opinion, uh, we use both diploid and uh, tetraploid uh, varieties. We like to have a blend of that in all of our mixes. And in my opinion, perennial ryegrass has the potential to be one of the best perennial, or uh, the best perennial grasses out there. So those are uh, two of the main forages that we use along with beneficial endophyte fescue, Timothy smooth brome, and then we're always sure to add either one or two uh, legume components in our mixes, alfalfa, red clover, and white clover. Where we live in Bucks County, our soils, we have a heavy clay soil, it's very wet, it doesn't drain very well, alfalfa is very, very hard to grow. So we actually find ourselves in this picture up here is a field of red clover, maybe 10% Italian ryegrass, uh, we find ourselves growing a little bit more red clover, and um, the reason why we like using red clover, one, is because it handles the wetter soils and the poor drainage a lot better, but two, uh, we treat that as a biannual. We'll have that crop in place for about two years, and we rotate that with our, uh, our uh, annuals that we do. So we'll, we'll do our annuals in our field for about a year or two, um, and then we might come back with a red clover, have that there for a year or two, and then we keep that cycle going. Um, on our farm, we're only allowed basically certain pastures can be pastures and cer certain pasture and certain fields can be used for annuals. Um, we, we don't have that ability to use every field for annuals due to runoff and, and terrain and stuff like that. It makes it pretty difficult. Uh, we don't graze any lower than four to six inches. Um, we actually use the method in the spring, leave half, take half, leave half. Um, during that spring flush, we try to, we don't let them eat it down to four or six inches. Um, grass is growing too fast to be able to leave them on it that far, so that's kind of the method we use. When grazing during the other months, we do use that four to six inch method. If it does start getting a, two, two, a little lower, we will put them in a dry lot or we will we'll put them in a sacrifice pasture where, where we will supplement them um, so they aren't eating it down. And uh, we do the same thing with our cutting height. Uh, we don't skim the ground when we cut our perennial hay. Uh, we're, we're cutting probably at three to four inches. And uh, we've noticed a tremendous difference in regrowth and in you know, the crop really hanging around for years after uh, when you think it would have died out already. So we do make sure our cutting height is up. Something else that we do is uh, harvest 30 to 50 acres of perennial pasture. Just because of the spring flush, we don't like to let, let it burn out. So we will harvest some of that. Perennial forages rotationally graze 300 acres of perennial pasture. Our pasture and hayfield mixes consist of five to seven different varieties, uh, grass and legume. Uh, dry hay, we make about 700 rounds of dry hay, 65 inch rounds. And uh, perennial haylage, we'll make about 325 plus 55 inch rounds. Annual forages are one of the big things that we do. That's our bread and butter. That's really what has taken us to the next level. 
Our two main uh, annuals that we use are sorghum, sedan grass, and sedan grass. Um, millet is something recent that we started using. Uh, triticale, annual ryegrass, and crimson clover. I like to have that legume uh, component. And then also oats and brassicas. Uh, growing annuals have been one of the key components in this operation for maximizing profitability. Uh, there's basically four main ways that has done that. Uh, forage quality and quantity. Uh, we're making better forage on less acres. We're producing more tonnage on less acres. That's less times over the field that we're doing, and we're producing more forage that way. Animal gains and carcass quality, we're producing our, our, our steers and heifers that we finish. They're producing anywhere 650 pounds to 700, uh, 700 pounds, and our quality has gone, gone up. Our, I've noticed it. Our customers have noticed it. Our wholesale distributors have noticed it. Extending the grazing season, we're able to graze about 10 months out of the year, putting those the brood cows, the cow-calf pairs out on uh, pasture, out on uh, annual ryegrass early. And uh, I'll go in a little bit more about how we extend the grazing season in a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, also reducing feed costs. When I first started in 2012, our annual feed costs, our annual feed bill was $70,000. Outrageous. Um, last year it was zero. So there's some ways. Warm season annuals, we played in about 100 acres of sorghum sedan grass and sedan grass. Uh, we set 10 acres aside for rotational grazing straight off the bat. We put our finishers that are going to be finishing that year on the, the sorghum sedan grass. Uh, 40 acres of that is first cutting chopped into a 200-foot ag bag. I like feeding that to my wean calves, my yearling animals. They seem to eat a lot better and produce a lot better off of that. Second cutting is grazed. You can see down here, this is how we graze our finishers through our sorghum sedan grass or sedan grass. We strip graze them uh, through that, and you can see they really don't waste too much. There is a little bit there, and it does scare some people, uh, but they do consume that quite well. Then we have 50 acres of first and second cutting balers for haylage. Uh, that we do uh, of sedan grass. I like using sedan grass for haylage. Um, it bales up a lot easier and they consume it a lot easier without being chopped. We did a trial uh, where we produced an average daily gain of 3.5 to 4.5 pounds a day. Uh, some of our steers actually went over 4.5 pounds a day when strip grazing during the summer months. Well, we did 65, 900 pound steers and heifers where we grazed for a quarter acre a day. Uh, we gave them four to six foot sections and we did that about five or six times a day. Um, here's a picture down here in the corner. We like to save 20 acres at least. Uh, for se uh, It's the second cutting, so we'll chop off the first cutting, and then we'll let that second cutting regrow after we put about 55 to 60 pounds of nitrogen on, and we'll save that for grazing our dry cows over the winter time. Uh, getting into forage analysis, uh, I just want to talk about this real quick here, sedan grass. You can see the high protein right here. That's 14.5. Pretty impressive. I was, I was pretty excited when I saw that. Um, digestible protein, 9.4. Relative feed value, 96. And TDN, uh, 62.2. Sorghum sedan grass, you can see it's just about the same uh, all throughout. Uh, so it's a real good crop, real nutritious. We ever put a lot of pounds on uh, by, util by using this crop. Cool season annuals, do the same thing, 100 acres here. Uh, 10 acres are set aside cow-calf pairs for grazing in the early spring. Uh, then we do 70 acres of small grains harvested for haylage of triticale annual ryegrass and crimson clover. And we have 20 acres of brassicas and oats that we graze our stalker cattle on. And we use a, a, a mix on that, tiller rashes, bar can't turn up purple top. And uh, we like to have a, an oat component in that to add fiber. And they also have free choice uh, dry hay just to keep their rumen tight. Sales and marketing, we have a retail store where 40% of our beef is sold. Open for two days, we'll sell by the piece. Um, we have a 25% higher profit margin than we do on our wholesale, and we do utilize all of our cuts on that. Uh, selling bones, fat, organs, everything. Uh, our wholesale market, 60% uh, of our beef is sold there. It's sold by the carcass. We do get a premium, 325 to 350 hot weight, uh, so we do get a higher price. And uh, the commercial market does not affect that price. It's kind of in its own little uh, area there. Uh, all of our call cows are processed in the four to six ounce patties and so do three local restaurants for five, $5 a pound. And we do make a premium on our call cows after butchering, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty impressive. The next chapter in my life, I've talked a little bit how I work for Tussock Sedge Farm. I no longer work for Tussock Sedge Farm. Um, I was supposed to be starting today, but starting on Wednesday, I'll be working for Thistle Creek Farm. I'll be working for George Lake in Tyrone, Pennsylvania. And uh, I think he is just a master grazer. I think he's a real good cattleman. He won a lot of awards here uh, through the AFGC, 
and um, he does a lot of good things that we do as well on the farm I used to work at. Um, one thing that he does differently is winter grazing 110 dry cows on standing corn. I'm pretty excited to see that. He tells me 26 cents per day per head is what his input costs are, uh, so I'm pretty excited to see that. Uh, here's a double rainbow over top of the farm. Using sorghum sedan grass and sedan grass has made our farm a lot more profitable. We have better gains, and in my opinion, I believe that we have found a pot of gold under our, under our farm here. Um, Hopefully you guys, um, in your, in your grass-fed operation or in your cattle operation, you can use annuals like this and maybe uh, you'll find your pot of gold. So, any questions? Yes? Well, we do not. So that is one problem with, we are scattered out around um, the township and we have seven different locations where we house cattle for grazing. So those are all basically portable water tanks. When we are winter grazing our brassicas or when we are winter grazing our uh, stalks of sedan grass for our dry cows, we do have those in a location where we do have uh, freeze, freeze proof Richie waterers. So when, it, when the temperatures do get down, we do have to bring those cattle in and uh, you know our finishers, we do finish in a hoop barn in the wintertime. They aren't out grazing. They are getting silage, and uh, they do have the, the waters there. Any cattle that are out on pasture, we do make sure that there is either an alley or somewhere where they can access water. Yes. Our average finish weight, um, are you talking about carcass or live weight? Uh, I mentioned uh, the carcasses there. Uh, our carcasses range anywhere from 650 to 700 average. We've been as high as 750. When I first started there, the average weight was about 550 pounds. By using these different forages, um, we are able to increase our average daily gain, increase our carcass weight. We are seeing a lot more marbling, a lot more fat cover and finish cover in our beef, and our consumers are noticing that as well. Yeah, so I was trying to speed through it a little bit, um, so I did miss the little things. We are using brown midrib variety for more digestibility. We also are using a dwarf trait. Um, it has a higher leaf to stem ratio that I really appreciate, and I think that animals do too. I think it grazes a lot better. Um, we, we've noticed when grazing the, uh, a dwarf trait, we're noticing that there's a lot, uh, the animals are taking a lot more in, and you don't see a stem left on the ground. When grazing the warm season annuals, you really see the cattle. They'll go through and they'll pick those leaves first. But if, they're, you know, if that crop is five, six, seven feet tall and sometimes it gets ahead of you, um, you'll, you'll, you will see a stem there. So we do like to use dwarf varieties. Thank you.